Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Aberdeen. This day, September 22nd, 1842, the banks of the Mississippi River in Alton, Illinois, are crammed full of spectators awaiting a highly anticipated duel. A showdown between a man named James Shields, who you probably have not heard of, and another man, his chief political rival, a guy by the name of Abraham Lincoln, who I hope you have heard of. Uh, So what in the world is a young Abraham Lincoln doing standing on what is known as Bloody Isle in the middle of the Mississippi River about to duel with a rival? Let us find out the answer to that question. I'm joined, as always, by Nicole Hemmer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Lincoln is getting known more and more every day, more and more famous. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. Fair enough. Uh, hello, Jody. And Alexis Co is back with us, author of the New York Times bestseller, You Never Forget Your First, and uh, repeat guest on this show. Thank you for joining us, Alexis. Yeah, I'm so excited. People are starting to talk about Lincoln, too. It's it's really great. Little known fact, guys, he was a Republican. People don't know that. Yeah. You don't <laughs> ever hear that. It's not in the history books, but it's true. <gasps> Okay. Republicans are okay. Never mind. Can we can we can we stick to the actual little known facts about Lincoln, which is that he almost got in a duel, which to me at least I, was is relatively new. So, Alexis, I will start with the question I asked in the intro: What in the world is a young Abraham Lincoln doing standing on Bloody Isle in the middle of the Mississippi, about to get into a duel with James Shields? First of all, people always sleep on young Lincoln, who was fighting left and right with people, not dueling. This is rare. But he was giving these impassioned speeches against the Mexican-American War. And, you know, he isn't the Lincoln we think of now. He's a Lincoln who's, like, trying to make a name for himself. There's um, a problem in Illinois, which is that uh, the banks are no longer accepting paper currency from citizens. And this happens throughout early America, where suddenly they're like gold or, like, we're not accepting. You know, currency came in all sorts of forms. Sometimes people paid their rent in, you know, bushels of, of whatever. Um, so it's pretty difficult. This happens uh, like every rebellion. They're always like, give us gold and silver, and then people freak out. Um, Shields was in a difficult position, this this person who's going up against uh, Lincoln because he was the state auditor, um, and he wanted to close the bank. There's like a bunch of bad letters going back and forth that are published under uh, pseudonyms. This is also a big thing in America. And... Lincoln says some things about Shields and the ladies and um, nothing that bad as I remember, but but it you just don't do it and basically challenges him to a duel, right? Which is kind of amazing because we had an episode not too long ago about the bank wars. And here you have mm. sort of the, the physical manifestation of the bank war. The banks have closed and now here are two guys. I guess they're not really fighting about the banks, but they're kind of fighting about the banks. Yeah. But it is a reminder of how how much um how heated people got about a monetary, monetary policy, policy back then. But also Alexis to your point, I mean these letters that are going back and forth. Lincoln is a state representative at this point. Um but these letters going back and forth. I mean I think way back when we did an episode about the canning of Sumner and somewhere in there mm-hmm. there was always that moment where like someone says something about their opponent and women and like yeah. that always feels like the moment where the gloves come off and the duel starts to happen. I mean it's just like when it gets personal, is it just is this just an era where no matter who you are, no matter what policy argument you're having, if someone just says something about your personal life, then here we go. 
it all falls under honor. This is, all goes in the honor file. And if you want to fight with someone, you don't talk about their policies or you don't talk about banks. You talk about them personally. And the best way to do that is to talk about women um, in, in just any sort of sense. It could be the most subtle of criticisms or even commentary. Someone has been going and courting someone and it's kind of, it's over um, if the person doesn't want that information out. And they feel as if they've been wrong, but usually it's some sort of pretext to just have the fight that they really want to fight out. And I have to say that there's, uh, well, Lincoln, there are these big stories about him. You know, he built a log cabin on his own, which is insane. How would you do that? Um, but he, I mean, he did a lot of stuff on his own and his life was very difficult. He was certainly raised in the woods, but that's, I mean, just think about it. It's a log. Um, <laughs> but I think that the, the the young Lincoln, um, he's very tall. <laughs> you know, he's got presence. He's no, but he, you know, he's not. He's getting messed with left and right. He's no George Washington. Like people aren't sort of like this doesn't happen to George Washington. Let's put it that way. And so you think, okay, yeah, I can totally take him. And even Lincoln knows it's a bad idea because he's like, if he has a pistol, I'm done. Let's use swords. Which, to be honest, was not that much better for him. It was just another option. I kind of love this detail, by the way. I guess I knew, because I've listened to the Ten Dual Commandments, um, that you get to pick your weapon. <laughs> but the fact that he was yeah. like, I'm going to get the biggest sword I can find, and A, that's going to keep me from getting shot, and B, my arms are longer, so I will probably be able to stick him before he sticks me, um, is, is the kind of logistical thinking that I, I'm shows what a good an eight-year-old would do what an eight-year-old would do um <laughs> yes yeah does, does not show him as the guy who's going to like win the civil war down the line yeah so i mean and it kind of works right i mean so just to sort of paint the scene here they go out to bloody isle which i guess from what i gather is like a sort of like a sandbank in the middle of the missouri which has this name bloody isle because it's where people would go to duel it's not too far from st louis but like you know you have a physical space that is just known as the dueling spot. So they go there um, and they have decided they're going to use swords and, and they're standing a few feet apart and there's like a plank between them and Lincoln picks up his sword and what, like chops down a branch that's over shields his head. And what happens? Like shields just realizes like, Oh, this guy has like really long arms and a really big sword. I don't want to be a part of this. It worked. That's the thing. It's sort of like when you, um, you know, it's like, it's like it's six dogs in a trench coat, basically. <laughs> like, but Lincoln sort of came correct, and, and Shields, who was like pretty average size, even like a little bit tall for the age. Lincoln, again, it's very tall. Um, was sort of like, oh, maybe this matters, or maybe Lincoln has some secret moves. And again, this is about honor. And what he does here is actually really far more remarkable than challenging Lincoln to the duel itself. He walks away. And it's hmm. not just remarkable in the moment because, again, honor is everything. And think about that. Why we think of it as honorable. Why would you die over something so dumb? Everyone's watching. Everyone knows it's happening. It's a pretty big deal. He's losing a lot of face, but he does. And we are very grateful to him for it. We don't read about Shields in the history books, but he does mm -hmm. go on to have a pretty memorable career. He bounces around Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri. He becomes a senator from each of those states, um, which is a hat trick that not many people in history have pulled off. He founds a town in Minnesota, calls it Shieldsville. Pretty on the nose kind of name, not that creative, yeah. but still like yeah. a legacy. And then he fights in the Civil War under Lincoln, um, which is a pretty impressive doubling back of their stories across one another. Yeah, not only that, Lincoln promotes him. <laughs> he recognizes, which is so funny because, of course, Lincoln isn't fighting. He's in the Oval Office, which is a very important place for him to be. But, of course, Shields is. He could have, again, totally taken Lincoln, but didn't. <laughs> Um, had he been the one to choose the weapon and he does well for him. They decide that they are actually on the right side. Whereas like when you hear, when I heard, you know, your transition, you think it could go a very different way. Okay. He's named a town after himself. This is not that that was that uncommon, but this is a guy who maybe is going to take this to the grave. Nope. They fight together on the, on the side of relative good. 
Yeah, though by all accounts, you know, they do get asked about this throughout their careers, and I don't think mm-hmm. they ever, I don't think they ever like became friends, but they just sort of acknowledged that this was in their history, and they and they moved on. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I don't even know if I can get through with a straight face, but does this lead to any any um, bank reform uh, in the wake of this deal? <laughs> Let's get back to the important part. Monetary yes. policy. <laughs> yes, exactly. I feel like by the time you're standing on a plank in the middle of the Mississippi River, uh, you've sort of forgotten what you, what, what you were actually there uh, about. Um, so I, I want to wrap up to something, Alexis, you've touched on a couple times, but I do think is fascinating, which is we have so much mythology around Abe Lincoln. And we actually have some early mythology around Abe Lincoln, right? The log cabin, uh, even like he was a postman. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some people, th- I know you s- maybe think differently, but some people think he was a very attractive young man, you know. There like, is a statue well, of young Abe Lincoln oh. that is extremely oh, yeah. hot. I'm just throwing yeah. that out there. Fair enough. There's some okay. evidence, He's right? He's very hot. He kept the union together. I certainly <laughs> prefer him to the guy who started the union. If if that's the game we're playing here, Fair enough. who, you know, s- study... Mary kill. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll play that game. It's okay. Listeners can, can email us with that. Study Mary kill uh, for, for presidents, for early presidents. But, <laughs> but, but like, why in the world is this not in that, you know, five things about Lincoln that everyone knows? I mean, this seems like so tailor made for that. Hey, geography. I mean, a lot of it, Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, because I think this is, this is closer to my time period, but it's pretty much out of both of ours as far as where we skip around. But um, I think that you have to remember it's who tells our stories. And after Lincoln, the people who were telling his stories were people like Herndon and um, to a lesser extent, Mary Lincoln. And these are people who were also fighting against a lot of the challenges during Reconstruction. And so this was just not his biggest claim to fame, not even top five. Um, but it's really interesting. Again, I think there's a lot that we miss about Lincoln and I'm not interested in this man is a God. He was amazing. I'm really interested in how someone becomes a Lincoln, a Washington, a Kennedy, a Ford, a Carter, who you name them. Um, but I think this should be a part of his formative, you know, biography as, as much as having a mean dad and being kind of a jerk, by the way, like he was mean about women very often when he was young and sort of mean about Mary Todd Lincoln and Mary Lincoln. She didn't like Todd. Yeah. I think that that is, maybe that will be your next book, but like (laughs) how somebody goes from being kind of a cruel backwoods guy to being someone who people really admire and who um, is obviously very high in your uh, study Mary kill rankings. <laughs> yeah. And and I will say, you know, the story of Lincoln does is getting like layers added to it. I mean, I don't think people were talking about Lincoln and depression, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And now that seems to be part of his sort of sketch of who he is. And so maybe the duel will work its way back into the the mythology. I think that's also a part of it is that, you know, nothing happened. And right. so everyone's like, eh, it was fine. He had some yeah. more interesting things. But I think um, it is fascinating that it's not at all a part of his his biography. And I think, though, you bring up depression. And, and just as a foil, a part of the reason that has been such a story for the last 15 years is because the story of depression has mm-hmm. grown. Right. Um, and so people really identify with that, with Lincoln. I know so many people who have asked me about it. Um, and it's something they can relate to in a way that they can't actually relate to a whole lot personally. Um, but depression and seeing it in his letters and the way he talks about it, it feels very modern. And if you have experienced it yourself or you have seen it in someone else, you can understand it. Whereas, you know, failed fights, <laughs> we go sort of get over it. All right. Well, that's a good place to leave it. Uh, Alexis Co. thank you as always uh, for coming on. And thanks again for doing this. Thank you to both of you. And Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thank you, Jody. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Brittany Brown is our other producer. Follow us on social media. We're posting a bunch of stuff on Twitter and Instagram every day at This Day Pod. Keep sending us emails, thisdaypod at gmail.com. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.
Radiotopia. From P.